Hi, I'm Karen Schwarzkopf with Richmond Family Magazine. RFM is the free lifestyle monthly magazine that's available all over Richmond at lots of places you shop, work, and play, at grocery stores, the doctor's office, and gyms around Ashland to Petersburg. The RFM mission is to help Richmond build healthy families. That's why we make the magazine every month. And that's why I'm here today with Dr. Zaidi Bodas. We are partnering with the Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU to share information on topics of interest to Richmond families. Dr. Bodas, thanks for joining us today to chat about anxiety. It's an important topic for so many families. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself as a doctor and as a mom? Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so, um, I'm a clinical psychologist, and so I have um, uh, trained in uh, clinical psychology. I got my doctoral degree at, the, um, at Virginia Tech uh, with working with Dr. Tom Allendick, who is an anxiety expert. Um, and then I did my postdoctoral training uh, at the University of Maryland, and then I've been working at VTCC um, since 2007 mm -hmm. um, as a clinical psychologist. Um, I have two kids. I moved to Richmond when my daughter was born. Uh, so she is 10 years old um, in fifth grade, and I have a five-year-old who just started kindergarten. So we've certainly had our own share of anxiety this year um, with starting school. All right. So you have the younger kids, and I have teens. I have a 16, an 18-year-old, and a 20-year-old. And obviously one of your specialties is helping children with anxiety, so let's mm -hmm. just go for it. What is anxiety? So anxiety is um, an emotion that people describe in different ways. You know, children describe in different ways. Um, you know, younger children will talk about feeling scared or feeling nervous, or sometimes they'll sort of describe their experience um, of anxiety as feeling having butterflies in their stomach or belly. Um, or feel like their heart's racing. And then it's also described as, you know, worrying about different things, um, the future, the weather, <laughs> what's going on in the world, um, you know. And so I think people sort of experience anxiety in different ways uh, at different, you know, um, uh, stages in life. Um, and so we have sort of these, you know, um, a wide range of vocabulary. Well, in RFM this month, you wrote about anxiety and specifically how it affects children, mm -hmm. but um, obviously everyone probably has some level of anxiety. Can you talk about that, like the, the yeah. ages and how everything is? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, and first of all, I think uh, anxiety is often experienced as an unpleasant uh, emotion. Uh, it's not a good feeling sometimes for people, um, but it's a normal uh, experience in a lot of situations and it's it, so it's anxiety is normal it's everybody has anxiety uh, I can be open and admit that I had some anxiety starting uh, you know doing something that I've not done before um, so anxiety is normal everybody has anxiety it's also adaptive it's also a survival emotion you've needed anxiety to you know survive over the you know um, generations to um, who we are now as human beings. Um, so I think in, in some ways, uh, it is really important to recognize how normal this, this experience um, is. Um, Particularly this time of year when mm -hmm. our kids are looking at, and the families in general are looking at trying to adapt to back to school. Right. It's right. an anxious time, isn't it? Yes, it is anxious. And uh, it's an anxious time. And I, I think it's really important for parents and also maybe for kids to recognize that you know, that back to school, that day, the night before or the week before school starts is, is an anxiety provoking experience, but it's also normal mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, so, you know, there are so many unknowns when the school starts. You know, it's the end of fun, but it's also who's going to be my new teacher, what's my new schedule, am I going to be able to do the work in this new grade, who's going to be in my class, a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, well, and those kinds of things are the things that you uh, look at and and prepare for and you're anxious that they're coming so that makes you even more anxious right so what are some everyday anxiety triggers that you mm -hmm. see or that you're familiar with 
Um, would you say in particular, specifically with regard to starting school or in, more in general? Um, I think, well, let's talk about school and kids now, and right. then if you wanted right. to discuss, and we can talk about adults later. We right. all know what that looks like, right. too. Right. <laughs> So, you know, and, and I think sometimes children start to sort of have, like the younger children you see start to have some somatic complaints. You know, they'll say, my stomach, you know, my stomach hurts, my head hurts, I can't sleep. They get clingy and they want to get into their parents' beds and, mm -hmm. you know, they can't sleep. So you start to see some distress around this. Um, and with, with older kids, you start to see some worrying, you know, you see some avoidance of things, you know, um, you see some of those things. And so part of that, I think parents need to say, you know, it's kind of hard, it's kind of easy to say you're going to be okay and it's okay, it's going to be fine and, you know, sort of, but that's a little bit of a dismissal of that uh, experience, which is real, mm -hmm. you know, and to say, to normalize it in some ways, to say it is normal, you know, this is okay and sort of giving it a label sometimes contains that anxiety and that everybody has that anxiety. So everybody kind of feels this way and it doesn't feel good, but it's going to be over. Mm -hmm. It's going to not last forever. Do you think it's useful to say something like, um, remember how this happened last year mm -hmm. and this is how we dealt with it? Mm -hmm. Or to like, try to role play things mm -hmm. that might happen in school mm -hmm. that you could help kids deal with it. The right. tool, is that a good idea? Right. I mean, you certainly, one, I think if you normalize some of that experience and then you kind of work on, you know, how, what can you know, the idea that it gets better, mm -hmm. you know, remember last year we felt this way and then things got better, let's think of some of the things that helped you, mm -hmm. um, you know, so sometimes maybe for younger kids it's helpful to kind of go to school, you know, kind of familiarize with the building and, you know, things like that, little things to kind of increase that level of comfort with yes. the building uh, mm -hmm. or going to school, uh, even if it's to the playground at school, you know, something positive. Um, uh, with also sort of addressing the social piece sometimes, you know, we know who this teacher is, maybe we can, you know, see what she looks like on the website or whatever. Uh, finding out who the friends, you know, who their friends might be and mm -hmm. maybe setting up, uh, a, you know, a play date for the younger kids or, you know, making sure that the older ones feel like they have someone that they can connect to mm -hmm. or, you know, that they have a plan for managing sort of their social life. Um, that and that is anxiety in the younger kids, and we know that anxiety exists across the spectrum, right. for kids especially. And are there signs that a mom of a younger kid, like a, a preschooler, mm -hmm. four or five year old, mm -hmm. would look at and try to recognize versus what the parent of a right. teen right. would look for and start to be concerned about? Sure. Um, for the younger ones, you know, you see the, the, the more sort of a general response is inhibition, like they avoid normal, you know, or mm -hmm. get clingy, they don't want to, you know, separate from parents, uh, they cry, sometimes they can have a temper tantrum, they can be angry when they're anxious and they're, they can't avoid that situation. As they, with age, you sort of see some of the more worrying and the more cognitive symptoms, you know, they worry about things and they ruminate over those things and, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they avoid things that they um, should be not, you know, shouldn't be avoiding. They avoid doing their homework or they avoid going to school. You start to see some school refusal mm -hmm. when there's school-related anxiety. And uh, it's, you know, it may come across as an oppositional sort of behavior, but it's sometimes rooted in, in sort of their anxiety about going to school. How do you see um, sleep connecting to anxiety levels? Like in, mm -hmm. in smaller children, I might have looked at it as... Um, an issue with not being able to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. With my older kids, I found that when they were trying to deal with anxiety, they were sleeping more mm -hmm. in an invasive. Mm -hmm. Do you think that and sleep you, plays a role? Or Absolutely, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, in I, I think when you are looking at younger ch kids, there's that arousal right there, so mm -hmm. a little bit anxious, or, you know, they have this panicky feeling, they're clingy, they're crying. Uh, and with the older ones, the avoidance the avoidance behavior is sort of set in. And so you might see that sleeping because it's a way of, you know, possibly a way of avoiding whatever mm -hmm. it is that they're avoiding. Different it, way of avoiding, definitely. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and also with age, sort of the anxiety becomes more um, debilitating. It mm -hmm. sort of takes its toll on you. You're worrying a lot. You may not sleep as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so you sleep longer, um, you know, to take, to kind of make up uh, for that. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Bose, you mentioned adaptive thinking earlier. Mm -hmm. 
how can that help children cope with anxiety? Pick any age level, because we, we have them all. <laughs> right, right, right. So when we look at anxiety treatments, you know, we sort of look at, uh, you know, certainly how the, the body responds to it and sort of the physiological response and what are the, some of the strategies to calm that physiological response. But there's also the cognitive component of anxiety, which uh, what we call a cognitive bias. Um, so in anxious children and probably a, across the board, um, you know, children or adults, we see that children or people who are anxious are, have a threat sensitivity. So they are, um, they tend to overestimate the danger. So they are, you know, they're thinking the probability of something terrible happening or bad happening or something negative happening is much more than it really is. And then they also underestimate their capacity to kind of cope with these. So, this, so the negative, so, so you want to, in, in treatment, you want to change this kind of thinking. Um, and so adaptive thinking is sort of more realistic thinking, you know, it's not necessarily positive thinking and so that's the piece that I think parents have to kind of balance because it's okay to say everything's going to be okay, you know, and not kind of have to deal with that, but it may not be okay. Uh, so but what being is realistic is important. Being, being yeah. realistic is important. So, you know, having, you know, there's a lot of work, uh, a lot of assignments to be done and, you know, tests coming up. and you're feeling anxious and it's not a good feeling and that's 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 fine but to think that it's the end of the world or you know I'm going to fail or mm -hmm. you know things are not going to work out and so the negative spiral yeah. um, I think is more distorted and so you want to have more realistic sort of understanding of what your you know what your problem is and then you can sort of then you are sort of more um, looking at it from a problem solving perspective and so you feel more able to manage that anxiety and not feel like I'm, you know, I'm going to fall apart. And that plays into my next um, questioning mm -hmm. perfectly because it's an issue of giving parents and caregivers mm -hmm. um, tools so you can help right. coach your children mm -hmm. to take these little steps and reduce right. their anxiety right. and you give, you empower them right. to deal with their emotions right. and issues. Right, right. And so, I mean, in in a, in a word, you know, treatment of anxiety is really just facing that anxiety, you know, just, you know, confronting that. And that sort of means that you have to do the things that you're afraid of, you know, whether it's going to school, you know, you don't want to go to school, but refusing to go to school kind of feeds that anxiety, makes you kind of keep that anxiety alive. Uh, and so you have to go to school, um, but then what do you do to take kind of baby steps? Or what can, how can you support that behavior? Um, in, in small steps and, you know. Well, let's look at a couple of um, narrow circumstances, as you will, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, mm -hmm. the, do you have any tips for dealing with anxiety that's related to taking a test? Sure. Um, so I think, it, you know, it's sort of, in, in some ways it's broad, but I think you want to understand sort of where that anxiety is coming from, you know. Um, but generally speaking, I think if you can uh, think about or reflect on what are your thoughts about taking a test, you know, um, you can sort of have more realistic expectations about taking tests. One of the things I try to tell if he's a teenager is that I think you really want to focus on the effort and not the outcome mm -hmm. of a test. And so if you can... Are you prepared? Do you right, feel like are you prepared? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the catastrophic thinking that kind of goes along with you know, taking tests is like, I'm going to fail, it's never going to, you know, what if I forget everything, to kind of look at it and, um, you know, that thinking and to say, you know, have, you know, how have things gone in the past? Mm -hmm. Have you failed? And, uh, you know, are you feeling prepared? Mm -hmm. um, is there, you know, so, and to focus on sort of what, what is, um, what makes, you know, what's, what's the reality here and mm -hmm. sort of identifying that reality and to recognize that maybe I'm sort of catastrophizing this, maybe I'm making a round up molehill. When, and we've talked about really, um, I don't want to say basic issues, but I feel mm -hmm. like everything that we've discussed has happened mm -hmm. in my house a million times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when, as a parent, when is anxiety a serious, serious concern? Like when should I seek help for one of my kids? So, yes, anxiety is, is sort of a normal uh, experience everybody has anxiety and uh, you know most of the times I think um, parents kids kind of figure out how to how to deal with it 
it is a problem if um, you know the, the anxiety is persistent, um, which means it is um, you know it persists despite support and efforts and problem solving on part of parents, and you know it continues to persist. Uh, it doesn't resolve. It should. It's not sh you know short lived. Um, it gets in the way of functioning. Mm -hmm. So as I call it, if, if it messes things up for the family, you know, if it you know if the families. Uh, you know, the child's afraid of dogs and now the family can visit grandparents or the family can visit, you know, other family members or friends because the child's phobic of, of dogs or the child experiences a lot of distress when they are in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, so those would be sort of red flags or yellow flags and when you would want to consider, um, uh, you know, professional help. Let me get, give you a very... Um personal example. Mm -hmm. One of my daughters um, behaved in anxious ways when, if I would say, you mm -hmm. have a doctor's appointment Friday, yeah. mm -hmm. and we are, and I would say, you're going to have a vaccination. You're, mm -hmm. We need to get this done. Mm -hmm. And for the next week, she would be miserable. Mm -hmm. So across the board, I started, I changed my policy, mm -hmm. and I said, well, I'm just not going to tell her about the doctor's appointment, because right. I don't want to watch her be miserable right. for an entire week. Right. Um, and then I had to change strategies again because as she got older, right. she would say to me, Mom, why do you wait till the last minute <laughs> right. when it had been right, a part right. of my plan all right. along? Right. So, right. Right. Um, like, I mean, you, you should talk to your kids and tell them what's coming, right? right. And right. help them deal with the anxiety. Yeah, sometimes you kind of have to find that balance as a parent. I think finding out, you know, how, what is that window? You mm -hmm. know, what's a good window of, you know, letting them sit with it? Um, also, you know, using that as an opportunity to maybe think about it, sort of really, you know, look into that anxiety and what it is about, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what, are, what are you worried about? What part of that experience is really difficult for you? Mm -hmm. well, Where does it start, that kind of thing? And how do, you, how do you treat anxiety at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children? So my role uh, at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children is um, to provide psychotherapy. So psychological interventions, these are uh, primarily cognitive behavioral interventions. So focusing on making changes to how you think about anxiety or, you know, or changing your thoughts about the anxiety provoking situation uh, and also changing your behaviors and some, some of it also involves parent training and care mm -hmm. management. Well, so anxious children um, may actually have a parent who struggles with right. anxiety, yes. with their own brand of anxiety. Yes. Yes. And so how can parents who actually have issues mm -hmm. help practice some of those coping strategies with their kids? Um, I, think, I think recognizing, it starts with sort of recognizing that, um, you know, I'm anxious when my child's anxious. Mm -hmm. And it's a normal experience for most parents. It's hard to see a child in distress. I mean, that's just how it is, right? So... Um, recognizing that and, and sort of then looking at how is that getting in the way of my parenting this child as they need to be parented am I accommodating and feeding their anxiety am I allowing them to kind of get you know uh, am I encouraging any kind of avoidant behaviors you know if they're not wanting to go to school uh, that's okay because I can't handle the distress um, mm -hmm. around going to school or you know so that those might be some of the things that parents want to consider uh, and then seek help if if they feel like they need to have a perspective on this, then they need they could seek help. Um, and there is you mentioned that there is like a um, a family or a parent and child counseling issue, a situation that yes, might work absolutely. for some of those families. Absolutely. So th this can be done in different ways. Sometimes it's just the parents who come in to sort of get a consultation on what they need to do differently in the home and mm -hmm. sort of what might be the behavior plan for you know for parents to kind of manage, uh, especially for younger children. It should be um, as much, you know, as collaborative as it can be in involving child in the, in the treatment, but sometimes it is, um, it is not always a good idea because the child's anxiety kind of starts to build up as they hear that conversation. So it, but certainly there are options to work with the parents only, with the parent and child, and with the child only, so, you know, different sort of combinations of those. Mm -hmm. um, formats. I read recently about a, um, a trick or a tool mm -hmm. that a parent used called the possible versus probable mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And if you would say to your child, if he's maybe concerned that they are going to um, flunk a test horribly, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's possible that you could flunk this test horribly. Mm -hmm. You've studied. 
Right. So it's possible that yeah. you know probable mm -hmm. that you're going to do okay. <laughs> so right, to talk right. through those scenarios Talking with the Talking through mm -hmm. those scenarios the communication. I think is, yes, I think that's that's really I mean that's sort of where you do you know with the younger kids I say let's do some detective thinking. Let's mm -hmm. figure out how much you know what what are the chances of um, you know you not doing so well and then let's problem solve. If you feel like you really haven't prepared well, what can you do at this point in time? Mm -hmm. So when your thinking is sort of more realistic and less distorted, then it can result in sort of more problem solving about that. And you're talking situation. about it. Instead of saying to your child all the time, you're wonderful, you're fantastic, everything you do is great. Yes, and you you're going to be okay. You have the to child be realistic has, yes. and communicate. Yes, and problem solve, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. Well, I think that's all of the questions that we have in front of us, but I do have one more that I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing a lot more about the new Virginia Treatment Center for Children, which I brought up today. And can, so can you tell me a little bit more about the new facility sure. and how it will help children with anxiety mm -hmm. and other mental health care needs? Sure. Um, so we're hoping to be in this new facility, um, I, I hope between November and December, I think, uh, sometime in that time frame, and we are all very excited and looking forward to that. Our current building is not very, uh, I would say, mental health friendly at this time, and so we're all excited to move into a more, um, you know, state of art. Where is it? It's, it's going to be on the Brook Road campus, okay. Children's Hospital. Oh, it's a beautiful yes. neighborhood. It's a nice area. neighborhood. I think parking is going to be um, easier for families and patients <laughs> as compared to what we have now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we will have, uh, you know, lots of resources, mental health resources in the building, um, and uh, I think that would be wonderful for families. Yes. Well, thank you all for joining us today. If you have questions after watching this segment, please leave them in the comments below. And if you want to read more from Dr. Bodas, you can pick up this month's issue of Richmond Family Magazine. And um, remember, in the future, to pick up your free RFM every month. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for more information on building healthy families. And again, check back um, and leave questions in the comments below. Thank you.